So I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me here it to tell you that we are going to have a big change of gears. We are not going to I'm not going to talk about quantum systems. I'm not going to talk about many interacting systems. And maybe I will have a little bit of lack of ergodicity. The system I'm going to look at is the water around a number of biomolecules. And in particular, the question I'm addressing here, what is the effect of the biomolecule on the water and vice versa? Okay? But not all the water covering the biomolecule will be important, but only the one that's really hydrating the water, the, the, the biomolecule. What means that I'm, when I look to this picture, there are a few of these molecules that are just passing by that I don't care about. I care about the ones that are enough time around the biomolecule to affect the biomolecule and the biomolecule to affect them. Okay, that will be clear on the way. As another change of gears that everything I'm showing here is molecular dynamics. Okay. So what's the roadmap? So what's the question? What's the clues we have about these questions? What, then I'm going to examine two different systems, water in the protein surface and water in the DNA grooves. Okay? Two regions in which they are in, in specific surfaces, specific type of surface, and maybe we can get some solution, conclusions at the end. So before doing that, that's my research group, and if you have any question about the DNA work, Mike, that sits in the back, we can give you all the simulation details and the juicy matters about that. Okay. So my basic question today is what's the mobility of water when water is close to the surface? Is the mobility very different than the bulk mobility? Is the mobility related to the type of surface we have? What the, you know, the organization on the surface that changes that I'm going to change the mobility of water? So one example in which water changes the protein is when you have the folding. The folding is very much related with the fact that you have water around. If you dehydrate the protein, you don't have folding. So folding and have water around is important. So the, for the molecule, the water is very important. But my question is, for the water, is the protein also important? But before that, I'm going to bring you a few things in which water is not a common material. Water cannot be represented by little particles interacting in, in, in your box. That they do, the molecules of water do very uh, weird stuff, okay? One of the things that water does a very weird stuff is the specific heat, okay? That's just a comparison between the specific heat of water and methanol. And two things you can observe. The first thing is that water has a minimum in the specific heat, while the methanol goes forever when you are changing the temperature. The second weird thing is that actually the specific heat of water is very high. And there is a reason for being high. And there is a reason for having this change of slope here. And that would be, you know, the reason why I believe that there is this change of slope is the basis for all the, the changes in mobility that we are going to observe in water. Okay, is the minimum around, that's for uh, one atmosphere, and this minimum is always around where we live. With uh, that will be, we are going to talk about this on the way, okay? Because we need certain things that happen when you have disturbance. Okay. The second thing that also happens very close where we live is the compressibility. And again, you see a minimum when for tall when in other liquid materials, you see, you know, that's for different pressures. You don't see that for one atmosphere. You don't see this turning. It just goes up on and on. And the second thing is that the compressibility of water is very low. Okay? It's not like a solid, but comes close to be like a solid. It's, it's much more, it's more difficult to compress water than any other liquid that we have at room temperature. So it's, it's again, it's interesting, but this upping up is even more interesting. 
And the third thing is the thermal expansion. That's what we see every day in your life because we know that this, the, the ice, you know, is less dense than the liquid water. And that's not, not the normal thing to happen for any material. So this thermal expansion going to be negative means that we have a maximum in density of water. And the ice will be like here. So we have another thing that's kind of weird. Okay? And that's representing for different pressures of the sea. Water have more than 70, 70 of this type of unusual properties. And most of them will be related to one thing that we are going to come close close. Okay? Third thing, you know, another thing very interesting is that when you look to the diffusion coefficient of water, instead of being something like that for most materials, you increase the pressure and you have less, less diffusion, you have a region, and you can observe that this region is at very low temperatures, in which when you increase the pressure, you increase the density, you have an increase of diffusion. You understand? I pack more, I pack, pack, pack more, and the particles are more and more mobile. And these two things, the maximum in the diffusion that you see here, and the maximum in the density, that's the location for the maximum in the density, are very close by. So the two properties are located in regions of temperature and pressure that are correlated. OK. Let's look now for a very naive picture of water. You have the oxygens, the hydrogens. So the electrons come closer because you have more protons here. And you have kind of dipole. You have all the, the electrons more related to the oxygens, and you have our poor hydrogens uh, losing electrons, so it becomes more positive. Thanks to that, we have this, this polarization that creates what you call the hydrogen bonds. So we have charge transfer on that, and thanks to that, we make these hydrogen bonds. The hydrogen bonds are much weaker, much weaker than the covalent bonds. However, they are, they are strong enough that in any picture that you can take in the molecular dynamics of water, you're going to observe the formation of this type of structure that we call the drums. Means that water will be try to form up to the four hydrogen bonds with their closed molecules. And that generates that most of the time, you know, they form in this form, we are having the, you know, formations of water that are bonded that will be close to formations of water without being bonded to that. But then, in other regions of the same pack of water, you have the organizations of water that are bonded to another organizations of water. So if you imagine a glass of water, a glass of water at room temperature, you'll be disbonding and disbonding all the time. It'll be like that. The particles you bond. And for people that think that it's bound you know, have some memory, no. This water is so quick, this bounding, this bounding, that I think water has Alzheimer's. So it's really something that is there, but don't last. But if you make a, a picture, then you have these clusters of bounded mixed with clusters that are not bounded. Now we are going to come back to the question why you have this, what's the origin of this, this change? And now instead of calculating, The clusters is theory, okay? The measure is this, the anomalies. Now I predict things with theories that use the clusters, and then I measure and it works. Okay, let's go back. That's the question I'm, now I'm lo looking to the specific heat, okay? And we have this mystery, why the specific heat goes up, up, and up. Okay, that's specific heat. Why, the question is why it goes up, up, when the specific heat, when you decrease the temperature, does not go up, okay? So the idea is that if I have these clusters, and here I'm representing the specific heat as the fluctuations in entropy, if I have these clusters, and I say that each moment in water I have this mass picture, if I'm looking for the back of the room, you'll be regions 
which are bounded, but they are not linked with regions that are bounded. So it's like a peak bounded regions, and I mix them. So high entropy. And if I go very close by, I see bounded pictures. So as I decrease the temperature, these bounded pictures, they start to percolate in the whole system. And because they start to percolate, we start to have a high difference between the average, because it's still they are you know, aggregates of this cluster peak, the cluster's water, and this difference grows, and that's why you have this change in that. Okay? And if I can, using that, compute by molecular dynamic, looking, because in molecular dynamic I can look and see the clusters, I can see that they are increasing at the same space that this specific heat is increasing. Then I look to the compressibility. And the compressibility is the difference between the local volume and the average volume. And it, as you can see, as I go down in temperature, the patches in which I have, the tetramers, they grow. And because they grow, the average, you know, the local volume, okay, you be smaller than the, uh, it will be bigger than the local, the average volume, okay? And then the alpha, you be the mixture of these two things. Of course, this is, if I show you this idea with my fingers, not with real, if I do real things. If I do re real things, I do molecular dynamics. Then I go back, and I'm going to take my favorite model for water, and you have plenty of these models for water, and then I can measure the things, I can look to the clusters, I can see where they are, I can paint the clusters, and we do all the 74 anomalies of water using any of the, my favorite models for water. Okay? Here I'm going to show you one example of this for the SPC water. Okay? It's not the best model. If I take another more appropriate model, you get a similar result, but something we did many years ago. So this is the SPC water. We have the oxygens, we have the hydrogens. In this particular model, the hydrogens have no mass. And we put charts here, and we put charges here, and we run the system. And what you find is that in this model, this SPCE model, when I have the diffusion, remember I have these experimental results for the diffusion coefficient. When I have the diffusion coefficient against density, that will be equivalent to have pressure here, like the experiments. I have a region in which when I make the system more dense, I increase the diffusion, okay? Similar to what we observed in the experiment, a little bit shift in temperature, a little bit shift in pressure, and because I'm doing simulations, I can go to this region, in which is not showing the experiments yet, that's the negative pressure region, but there are people trying to do experiments for negative pressure, okay? So what we know more about that? We know that when I look to the system, and I'm very curious to know what happens in this particular region, that's the weird region, this, in which as you increase the density, the particles move faster, I decided to look something else in this particular region. I decided to look how when pe particles move, they rotate. You understand? The hydrogen bonds, let's return to the tetramer picture, to form this tetramer, that's the favorite configuration according to the theory, to form the tetramer, I have to have four neighbors. Okay? And in the simulations, I can count the, the energy, I can count that they are forming the bond, so I can look to this configuration. And so when the particle moves fast, means when the particles start to go in this fast, in this region, the particles are on average having four hydrogen bonds. So I guess, see, if they are trapped forming the hydrogen bonds, how come they move fast? The only way that they move fast if they are making hydrogen bonds is if someone is rotating, so the next particle is also making bonds. So that's why that's different vectors. What is showing here is the time to rotate have a maximum in the same place in which here the diffusion has a minimum means the particle ha 
takes more time to rotate, takes longer to do that, as the particle is moving slower. And you'll be faster doing that as the particle moves faster. Actually, this work from Jean Stanley's group showed that, in fact, the cluster of particles rotating faster are the neighbors of the particles moving faster. Means that in the simulations, what shows that if I have a group of particles moving like that, the neighbor particles are rotating. So the clusters around are not moving fast, but they are doing that. Okay? So you, like when you are in a bus, we still have this type of buses in Brazil, and you pass, to, you pay for the bus, and this thing does that, and you go in front. Okay? So you go in front, and the side is doing that. Like it's like turbulence. Okay? But it's organized. It's locally organized. You understand that it's not the same particle that's moving faster. That's the complicated thing. If you paint the particle, the part is going to move fast from sometimes, then it's going to stop, start to rotate, and the other ones, you, so it's not, some, because the bonds, they have Alzheimer, so they forget. So you, you, all the time you have just to track clusters fast, not particles fast. You know, you don't paint the particles, you paint the fast clusters that at, at some point will be here, another point will be here, but that's the basic mechanism. Another thing that shows that in the simulations before the film, that this is the mechanism, is that usually when you are not in this region in which particles move faster and rotate faster, uh, the average number of hydrogen bonds at these low temperatures is four hydrogen bonds. So being conservative, if you make four hydrogen bonds, if the hydrogen bonds lowers your free energy, you better to have just four neighbors. However, in order for you to move faster, you need to have, you f we found that you have a frequency of four, five, and six neighbors that's the same. Means the system packs. When the system packs, I start to have not four neighbors, I have to have six neighbors, but I make only four bonds. So I can do, and then we calculate the the strength of the hydrogen bonds, the hydrogen bonds be becomes very weak. So what particles do, I have this bound, but I'm not bounding here, but they're close enough because it's packed, so the particles start to switch from one bond to another bond, and again, we can see that on the film. Okay, so that's the basic mechanism. What, see, what kind of indicates that all this craziness of water is related to the fact that water, in fact, is as if it would occupy two states. One state in which is bonding, and another state in which is not bonding. Okay? Bonding and not bonding. And that would explain most things. A lot of groups in the world study water using a two-state kind of model for that. Okay. Here is just to illustrate that we have the diffusion and the density anomaly. That's experiments, and that's the simulation result. Some years ago, I started to understand if the water works as we it, the particles are wandering. No. Uh, the, when when I when I do the simulations, I have the energy interaction between. Any two molecules, okay? I have these two molecules. The energy interaction for the hydrogen bonds is very specific, and the distance is very spe specific. Particles don't. Ah, in the real material, people don't measure the hydrogen bonds. What they either do, they either measure some dynamic or thermodynamic property, okay? And the thing we do in this way is say, if this is what is going on, that will be the result when you compare it with the experiment. Uh, we found no, no. We need the bonds. If you take any material that will not form the hydrogen bonds, will not have the, the interactions, they will not have the same behavior. We, 
normal material, if you take a system that to be like metronome, they don't have the, that type of bonds, they don't go up. There is no way they would go up without the, the hydrogen bonds. So the hydrogen bonds are really the key thing for life. Okay? So now we decide to, if this break in the bonds, you form the bond, you break the bond, it's so important. If even in water, this is very relevant if the cluster is bonded or not bonded, what happens if now I confine water? Okay? I confine water, it means that there is a, be a whole region that is the, the wall in which either I cannot make hydrogen because I have uh, a material that don't make bonds, or I have a very strong hydrogen bond if I have a material that makes huge hydrogen bonds with water. So I have two options on that. And I have a second question, that is the fact that due to space limitations, I also, I'm for space, maybe breaking some bonds of the structure. Okay? So what people did is that they confined water in carbon nanotubes. Here's just a cartoon for the simulation in which you put water here, put water here, you have water inside the carbon nanotube too. Many very interesting things happen. One thing that I'm not exploring here is the fact that when you have the flow, that again is not, is not equilibrium, is uh, just a dynamic thing. If you have the flow, the flow of water in carbon nanotubes is a thousand times faster than should be if you use your favorite hydrodynamic equations. And the, this is, in fact, related with the fact that water lines through a single line of hydrogen bonds when it's in a very tiny tube. Okay? So the hydrogen bonds play a very important role. If you put something else in your car another material in your carbon nanotubes, the f the, there is no enhancement flow like the one observed in there. Okay? But a second property that also happens when you put the water inside the carbon nanotubes is that the diffusion, remember the diffusion I mentioned before, the diffusion as you take the carbon nanotube and you do that, is going to change, going down, and then goes up again, okay? That's the result for simulations, but the experiment saw something very similar. So if you do that with water, the diffusion, naturally you think that you go down because you are decreasing the space available for particles to move, it's going to go to zero, what means that is the water freezes in a temperature in which should not be frozen, okay? And then if you squeeze a little bit more, gets liquid again and moves again, okay? This is observed either in experiments, but also when you have Cellulose, you take a matrix of cellulose, you put in water, and you freeze it, you, and you do that when you want to produce second generation of ethanol, they observe that they, when they melt back, there are some water inside that stays frozen, okay, even at room temperature. So they... Not one, one tetramer. One, you, you, this limit is having two tetramers side by side then you will go to one. When you have one tetramer, not one molecule, one tetramer, you get that. That's in real units, that's two nanometers, okay? That you can fit two tetramers, but then you go down, the two tetramers, they do that, okay? They align, okay? And, and not are bounded only this way, they don't bound. That's because I have Carbon is hydrophobic, so you have a whole space in which you don't find water close to the wall. Okay. So then we start to, uh, people start to ask themselves, what happens if now the wall is not only hydrophobic like the carbon, but full hydrophilic? You take a wall and you put your OH groups in carbon, or you take your favorite material, the sulfite of molybdenum. You have many materials that are hydrophil hydrophilic, and what they observe, and from bottom to up, what you are changing is the density, like you changed in the diffusion before. We are keeping the temperature fixed at room temperature, and you are do, we are doing that, okay? The stop on top is when you have, the, let's go back. I'm exploring here, adhesion here, adhesion here, and adhesion up there. So what I'm sh showing here is that when you look to the hydrophobic 
and hydrophilic walls, and the two colors, the, the red one is hydrophilic, the blue one is hydrophobic, and I compare the viscosity with the diffusion, what you observe that when you have this type wall, the smaller wall, and I start to increase the density, getting to, remember, then when I increase the density, I'm getting to that region in which the diffusion of bulk water starts to go up because particles move fast. And I start to increase, I go to that minimum, that minimum in the diffusion, and what to observe that in that region for hydrophobic walls, something very different from hydrophilic walls happen. So it gets flat and viscosity, the two things, viscosity and diffusion, is not, are not correlated again and simply stochastic and goes bananas just for hydrophobic walls, but not for hydrophilic walls. So the, in the hydrophobic walls, there is something that violates stochastic related to that balance between the diffusion and the viscosity. And that is due, again, to the scenario that explain they are like that, and they have this transition to that, and that happens in a much more abrupt way when you have hydrophobic walls and we have hydrophilic walls. I shared. It is very, you know, it's, it, you have just the tube, so I take one of the bottom layers which here. So then uh, what you look at, the number of edgerdin bones for the hydrophilic and hydrophobic, and you can see that the structure in both cases are different because in the hydrophilic walls, the, the water at the wall, they are trapped to the wall, so they generate a correlation inside the tube, and that's why it slowed down a little bit the, the the diffusion and you do have that change from two layers to one layer. Okay. Now I come to the protein. Okay, so I start to, but the protein is neither hydrophobic or hydrophilic. They usually as a mixture of both. So now we want to look what happens when I take a protein. We take a very small protein called TS kappa, that's from a scorpion. A uh, scorpion of Brazil, and you, and it's very small. It's, you have like uh, eight groups that are hydrophobic, and 27 that are hydrophilic. So very small group. So we can paint them, and we can see what happened with the water on the first layer, and how I define the first layer. Let me show you first this. I define the first layer by the peak in the radio distribution function of the oxygen of the water in the, in the, in the surface. So I define when I have the first layer, I cut there, and I'm going to look the water that are in this first layer. Okay. So that's my protein. The protein is folded. I take care that she never, the protein never unfolds inside the, the water box. So I have the full water box, but I'm just interested what happens in this layer for the diffusion. Anyway, we calculate the density. Remember, water have this maximum in the density. And we observe that is the bulk water. And this is two results because I do that with two different models because people could complain saying yes, SPC is one model, so you took another model that's slightly different, slightly less structured as, as ST4 2005. And actually, ST4 2005 is the best model for diffusion. So we look at that, and the first thing you observe is that when you have the protein, the water in the protein, you get more density. What means that, in fact, even though my protein have hydrophobic and hydrophilic sites, because I have more hydrophilic sites, the water packs more than would pack in the bulk. Okay? And that shows that here, because the number of hydrogen bonds, water water, in the case of bulk water, is, is higher than the protein water. What means that the protein actually breaks some bonds to pack more the water. Break water water at the hydrogen bond. So that's just to show again the, the radio distribution function of water that allows me to say, I'm going to look to this layer of water, and I'm going to observe what happens inside this layer of water. 
different from the matrix. Now I sit in each group in the protein, and each group of the protein I'm going to make a few properties. So I make, I am a group of hydrophobic, and that's all the, some examples of these groups that are hydroph hydrophobic, that are hydrophilic. I sit down and I look properties of the water inside that, okay? Uh, and here what I observe that I, as I increase the temperature, I have a lower density for both hydrophobic and hydrophilic, what means the particles will be disattached for the protein when I increase the temperature. That's not a surprise. That's for the SPCE, and the same result we observe for the tip 4 p 2005 uh, also, the number of hydrogen bonds, as I heat up the system, they decrease, but that also decreases when you have uh, bulk water, but they decrease more because the protein already broken some hydrogen bonds, and when you move away from the protein, it's harder for the, the molecule to bond again. And that's for the tip 4P 2005. Another thing we did is to look now the if the hydrophobic sites and hydrophilic sites are different. So are the water in the sites much different in terms of the hydrogen bonds? So we look to the water protein and the water water. But water water in this little box that I create around my hydrophobic. So I have my hydrophilic or hydrophobic side. I have this little box and I look to the hydrogen bonds of the particles, either water protein or water water, and I can see that there's a big difference when I look to the hydrophobic or hydrophilic site. That's not surprising because this hydrophobic site they make very little hydrogen bonds with the protein and they make more bonds of the water. What surprised me a little bit that I would expect that it will be larger than the number of hydrogen bonds making with the protein. And yeah, that's the reason why the particles of water are dragged to the protein is because the protein is more hydrophilic than the water-water interaction. Then we decided to look to the diffusion. And what I was expecting, that the particles at the protein would have a very different diffusion than the particles in the book. And, but in particular, I was not expecting that the, diff the, the mobility at the hydrophobic sites and hydrophilic sites would be very different. But I was mistaken, because if you look and this, in these calculations, I'm only looking to the particles that stay in that little box. So suppose now I have a particle that is moving in the far away from the protein, arriving at some moment, and it's here, okay, close to the protein. That particle, I'm not considered bounded to the protein because the particles will come and go back. So I'm subtracting all the particles that during the calculation of the radio distribution function are not all the time around the protein, okay? And what they see, I see one thing. First, you observe that is the bulk, when I have bulk water and I'm decreasing the temperature of bulk water, I have uh, a change, it's smooth curve, but I have a huge increase when you start to pass certain temperature. And that temperature coincides with the same kink that I observed. That means it's kink means that the particles are moving very fast about this temperature, almost as it's going to go away from the protein. They are still in the box, but they will be most of the time trying to escape from the box in that fish, almost as in the box. However, for the particles that are in the hydrophilic sites, you see this change of slope in a much lower temperature. And I want to understand why is that? Why you have this two different, what's the mechanism be behind the, this thing? Always in the box. But they can be moving like that. They can move uh, to the other group, okay? So I make this little box in the, no, the box is, suppose that's the protein, okay? Here's the hydro, I have my hydrophilic site. I make, you know, like a cube here, and I only look at the diffusion inside that. 
So if a particle starts in the time zero here and goes here, I don't count it. Exclude it. I only count the diffusion of particles that are added at the protein. Yes. So the size, uh, we choose, and for the size, we choose the first hydration layer. That's the G of R, okay? If I take more hydration layers, the, the results change. But I choose the first hydration layer because it's the distance enough for the hydrophilic to be, to have a chance to be bounded to the protein. If I wait longer, eventually it will leave. So I have shorter times just to, if I wait on there, all then will leave. I just want to see in the time in which enough for the system to be able to have a mean squared displacement that I can calculate the diffusion. Ah, the time scale I use, a time scale that's short enough for me to not lose uh, all the particles because eventually I'm lo losing all the particles. Yeah, it do depend. Okay, and that's a very small protein. They barely do that, okay? Anyway, uh, so we decide to look what happened. That's the mean squared displacement, but for something different. For the hydrogens, you know, the connection of these hydrogens with the, pro with the water molecule. And we observe that, now I look to the protein, and I look to the hydrogen bonds with the protein. And what I observe that they change of this, how they make the bonds, okay, with the protein, is related with the hydrophilic sites. So the dynamic of the hydrophilic sites is related to the ability of making one bond here, making one bond, because I have just many groups, making different bonds in different sites of the protein for this subset of particles that are the one bounded to the protein. Okay, that's the lifetime, so I, start to look how much longer the water protein will, you, hydrogen bonds will when you compare in the hydrophilic sites and hydrophobic sites, they are very similar, and they are very similar also with the bulk. So this, this bonding in the protein is very similar to the water-water boundary anyway. Okay. Then we make a second question. You want to understand now what happened with this water when I put DNA inside. And what part of DNA I'm interested in? I'm interested in, in this region of the DNA, the grooves, in which you have like a confined geometry. And you have two types of confined geometry. You have the major groove that's a little bit larger, and you have the minor groove. And why I'm interested? Because these grooves, they have a mixture of hydrophobic and hydrophilic distribution. So we have a mixture of these two things. Moreover, the size effect that you observe in the carbon uh, nanotubes is going to be present as well, okay? So we, we want to look to that. That's just to have an idea that this is, the size is, is 34 angstroms, so that will be of order, both will be of orders of very few nanometers, one, two nanometers, okay? Very small like the carbon nanotubes. I want to look to the water. In this case, again, we took the radio distribution function here. We take into temperature just to show that because we are going to change temperature a lot. I don't want that my box. Again, I'm going to use the same strategy to have a box saying my groove will be up to this distance. Okay, so I use the hydration as the the scenario, and here I'm just calculating what happens with the hydration. Here's not having the box. I'm just looking to the overall box the hydration of water around the grooves, and uh, what's the difference when you have the minor and the major groove. Of course, the major groove have a little bit more structures. You have higher peaks, but in addition to that, the, di the, the, the type of layering is very similar. So we have kind of ten the system attempts to layer in a very similar fashion as we observe in the carbon nanotube. Then we calculate the mean square displacement of the systems, and you can see that if that's temperature for high temperature, low temperatures. If you have very low temperatures, you see subdiffusive regimes if you take the too short times. Okay. For calculating any diffusion, you have to take this 
last part, but again, you cannot take much longer times than that because you are going to lose particle this because again, I'm making this box to define what means hydrophobic and hydrophilic things. And that's the mean square displacement in the water. Then also we look to the uh, correlations. Uh, the correlation, that's the same calculation but using the h bond correlation functions that also you can see how the particles moved by the correlation of the, the hydrogen bonds. So that's the diffusion. What you observe? You observe, if you take the bulk water and you're going to look to the diffusion of water in the bulk in this range of temperatures for this model deploy here, that's the SPC, you're going to see something smooth that goes down. However, when you look to the water of the major and the minor groove, you're going to see that in both cases you have a change for what you call fragile behavior to a strong behavior with a bump in this, in this region of temperatures. So we see that we have, again, a transition that depends on the temperature that's related to this change of the systems from being more clusters making bonds to breaking the bonds and making uh, the system more disorganized like you observe. So at higher temperature, you have this behavior that's more a fragile behavior to a strong behavior. And why do I emphasize that? Because a lot of people claim that uh, having patches of fragile behavior of water in the dynamics with strong behavior of water in the dynamics is the responsible for many of the properties both of the protein and, and, and the DNA. And in specific, they look the whole DNA. So I'm claiming here that the signature of this fragile to strong behavior, you already can observe, is you just couple in the grooves where water is packed, and because it's packed, it has this attempt to form this lining that was also observed for the carbon dynamics. So if I can conclude, the main conclusion is that water is very fascinating, is very intriguing because it has more than 70 anomalies, but when you look to the water, you have to realize that it's not just one type of molecule, but most of the time water is bounding and not bounding. Because of that, you can think about a three-stage type of system. And when you look to that, it's very important, both the confinement because of the size confinement, but also the confinement due to the type of the walls, if the walls are hydrophobic or hydrophilic. And that is it. Thank you very much.